Welcome to a very special episode of the show. So shout out to my fellow creators, everybody out there in Iowa, Yangapalooza doing big things. Thought best I could do was finally do my video on Andrew Yang's Medicare for All, especially given that Elizabeth Warren today has announced how she's gonna pay for it, how she's gonna pay for her Medicare for All plan. Now, definitely been a little uh, chatter, um, especially following last, I think maybe, maybe it was a week ago, maybe two weeks ago, when Andrew Yang uh, made the statement that Bernie's Medicare for All was too disruptive. And that's what we're gonna talk about. We're gonna get into all of the weeds. Yeah, we're, gonna, we're gonna go on a journey, all right? This article from ProRepublica, or ProPublica, um, talking about Medicare for All. And like I said, we gotta lay a foundation. So let's just hop right into this. Following this subject, Richard Jenkins. Uh, he reached into a black computer bag he keeps near his workstation at Graceful Touch Barber and beauty salon and rifled through medical papers, pulling out an envelope buried deep at the bottom. It was an unopened medical bill for $971, now 17 months still overdue, that he had out of sight and out of mind. Another unpaid bill from May for $447.13 rest in a nearby drawer, both a result of an arthritic knee that needs to be replaced, keeps the 55-year-old master barber in near constant pain. So this is just the, the typical struggle you hear regarding um, our current healthcare system. But there's a deeper story here, okay? And that's kind of why I wanted to start off with this because as it goes down this article, the gentleman says, healthcare is ridiculous. These politicians really need to step their game up. But Jenkins shrugged when asked if Medicare for all, the slogan that is dominated early campaigning in the 2020 Democratic primary was the solution to his and America's healthcare woes. He, he mumbled something about being too young for Medicare and laid bear the disconnect between how voters think and talk about health care and how candidates do. And that is the underlying conversation. That, I think, is the foundation that really we need to be looking at uh, when it comes to Andrew Yang's position on Medicare for All. And to do that, we're going to hop over into some polling data on the language behind Medicare for All, because I believe this is the primary reason why there is a disconnect between um, Andrew Yang's Medicare for All and Bernie Sanders and the rest of the field. First, to be fair, Medicare for All is supposed to be a brand name, right? You know what I mean? Like Q-tip. Q-tip is a brand name, but then they're really called like cotton swabs, right? So but everybody just says Q-tip because it's like that's they're super popular, so they just call it a Q-tip. Well, technically they're not Q-tips. Technically they're cotton swabs, but you just know the brand name, and that's fine. That's kind of what's happened with Medicare for All as far as Andrew Yang is concerned, because other candidates have decided to say, Medicare for America, Medicare for people who want it, Medicare for yada, yada, yada. Andrew Yang chose to go with Medicare for all, which is kind of what is, uh, what kind of the issue is, right? That's what caused the big backlash when he flipped and said he, he supports what Bernie, the, he supports the spirit of what Bernie's doing, but he doesn't necessarily support Medicare for all. That's where he got himself in a little bit of trouble. It's make America think harder. Did I say that at the beginning? I meant to say that. This campaign is about making America think harder. So that means when you think about a policy that Andrew Yang is putting forth, you might have to reserve your knee-jerk reaction, table it, you know, maybe jot some notes, initial thoughts, go do a little bit of research, then come back and form an opinion. So we're going to hop over here to uh, public opinion on single-payer national health care plan, uh, plans and expanding access to medical coverage. The Kaiser Family Foundation has been tracking public opinion on the idea of national health plan, including language referring to Medicare for All. Since 2017, historically, our polls have shown a modest increase in support for the idea of a national health, uh, health plan. And once we included the phrase Medicare for All, which has only recently slightly decreased to about half holding favorable views, dropping to 51%. So this is a language thing, okay? Uh, I think Yang strategically chose to say, I support Medicare for all because it's the brand name. Like, hey, isn't it easier to just say the thing that people are already very familiar with and try to create this new version of something that we already know? And again, might not have been the best move because it seems to have turned off some, some people. Burners have a problem with him calling it Medicare for all. You know what? That's legit. But at the same time, I don't know what the actual Medicare for All bill is called. So if the bill is called Medicare for All, I don't, I, I'm not going to say it is, but if it's called Medicare for All, technically, he'd be okay. Overall, a majority of Democrats and about half of independents favor a national Medicare for All plan, while most Republicans oppose. This is key. 
You notice that Andrew Yang keeps saying things like, I'm the only other candidate that 10% of Trump supporters would vote for. There's a reason in that Yang is, you know, he's a pragmatic dude. You know, he, he's not wildly progressive. I mean, he's definitely more centrist than you might think if you, um, I don't know, maybe if you just hear UBI, but if you look at his, I mean, he's, he's a capitalist. Just look at his positions. Listen to him speak. He, he's not saying things to excite you. He, he's, he's telling you, look, this is what makes sense. This is what we can do. Let's do that. The benefit of that um, is that he can appeal to progressives. He can appeal to centrists. Um, he can appeal to conservatives. That, to me, is a good candidate. You know, he's not going to be perfect for everybody, but if he can get a little bit of everybody and he, he's working for people as the way he thinks will lead you to believe, he's going to come up with rational policies that make sense for America. Yet how politicians discuss these proposals does affect public support. When asked why they support or oppose a national health plan, the public echoes the dominant message in the current political uh, climate. All right, that's figure seven. Uh, a common theme among supporters, regardless of how we ask the question, is the desire for universal coverage. There is robust support among Democrats and even support among Republicans for an expansion of the Medicare program through a Medicare buy-in or a Medicaid buy-in uh, proposal. Yet, it is unclear how much staying power this support has once people become aware of the details of any plan or hear arguments on either side. We're talking about how Elizabeth Warren's gonna pay for her, her uh, Medicare for All plan. It low key might not even matter. Once people realize they're not gonna have their own private insurance anymore, some of that support's gonna flip, man. Right? We have a trust problem in this country uh, regarding the government and regarding the police and, you know, bureaucracy. Like, people just aren't really feeling it like that. And once you tell a lot of people, look, this is what we're gonna have to do in order to give you Medicare for All. It, it doesn't become such a, oh, we definitely have to have that. You know, there are people who do feel that healthcare is not a right. So if it's not a right, then that kind of changes the conversation completely. But I'm just throwing it out there, just letting you know, like people don't all think in one way. Like there's a lot of different thoughts out there. And when you go to the other side of the aisle, a lot of people are gonna be like, nah, we're good. Current KFF polling finds that Americans know little about how the leading Medicare for All proposals would reshape the way all Americans get and pay for healthcare. People are having a conversation about a policy that they do not even understand. KFF polling shows many people falsely assume they would be able to keep their current health insurance under a single payer, suggesting another potential area for decreased support, especially since most supporters um, of such proposals think they would be able to keep their current health insurance covered. We have a language problem here. Yang is not 100% lockstep with everybody else. That's true. But America is not 100% on board with Medicare for All. Once every other candidate is forced to explain themselves the way Andrew Yang does, you're gonna start to see support for this issue change quite a bit. This is from February, February 7, 2019. A new poll finds only one in 10 registered voters want the equivalent of Medicare for All if it means abolishing private health insurance Plans. In a Hill-Harris survey released Thursday, 13% of respondents said they would prefer a healthcare system that covers all citizens and doesn't allow for private plans, an approach that is sometimes referred to as single payer. Do you see all this language? If I throw enough language, if I say single payer, public option, Medicare for all, Medicare for choice, Medicare for you, Medicare for America, all right, now vote. What? Where's the definitions of all these things? Wait, I'm confused. Which one did I choose? Wait, which one's the tax one? Which one's the... People, people are confused, okay? And remember, a lot of Americans aren't tuning in right now. A lot of people are still undecided. A lot of people are just like, you know, we'll just wait until the field's a lot more thin. I'm not about to study 19 dudes or 18 candidates. That's, that's ridiculous. The most popular option at 32% consisted of a universal government-operated system that would also allow people to buy private supplemental insurance. And only at a mere 32%. Remember we were just talking about 50 plus percent, 70 whatever percent. No, no, no. The most popular option at 32%, universal government operated system that would also allow for people to buy private and supplemental insurance. So that is a system that resembles like Canada. What is being proposed right now by Bernie Sanders is, dare I say, unprecedented. This, this is not what France is doing. This is not what uh, UK is doing. This is not what Canada is doing. No, no. He's proposing something that nobody does currently. I got this video right here. This is uh, Bernie Sanders on CBS this morning, April 10th, 2019. And what happens to those insurance companies after your plan is implemented? Under Medicare for All, we cover all basic health care needs. So they're not going to be there to do that. 
I suppose if you want to make yourself look a little bit more beautiful, you want to work on that nose, your ears, uh, they can do that. So but, basically, Blue Cross Blue Shield would be reduced to nose jobs. Something like that. I wanted you to hear it from the man himself. All right, listen, 2.6 million or so people work in the private insurance uh, uh, sector. So um, they'll have to find something to do. Maybe they can go dig ditches in Bernie's federal jobs guarantee, which he has only uh, put into about 300 words on his website. So. <laughs> oh, yeah. So somebody asked what other countries, what countries have Bernie Sanders health care uh, policy. So let me pull that up. And I'm just going to go through this whole thing because I, I do think it's important. It'll give you guys some context and it'll cover a couple of other questions I might not think of off hand. This is out of Vox. It's called Private Health Insurance Exists in Europe and Canada. Here's how it works. Presidential hopefuls in the Democratic primary in recent weeks found themselves facing a new litmus test. They want to eliminate health insurance, uh, private health insurance. This is from February 2019. Senator Harris faced a straightforward version of this question and gave a straightforward response. Let's eliminate all of that, she said, of private coverage. Cory Booker faced a slightly more confusing version of this question and gave a slightly more confusing answer that indicated support for keeping certain parts of the health care system private. An international perspective is helpful here. When you look at the rest of the world, the dozens of countries that run universal health care systems, you find that universal health plan relies in some form or another on private insurance. Basically, every single country with universal coverage also has private insurance, says Gerard Anderson, a professor at Johns Hopkins who studied international health systems. I don't think there is a model in the world that allows you to go without it. Other developed countries routinely use private insurance to fill the gaps of their public plans, or to offer patients a way to get to see a doctor a bit faster. Some countries, like Australia, even take aggressive steps like offering tax benefits to encourage citizens to enroll in private insurance alongside their public plan. Each co country has figured out its own role for private insurance, says Robin Osborne, a vice president at the nonprofit Commonwealth Fund who studies international health systems in almost every system. It tends to not be controversial because the commitment to basic coverage is there. Andrew Yang is committed to basic universal coverage. In Canada, for example, two thirds of the population takes out private plans, two thirds, two thirds in Canada, okay? By the way, that means they're paying for it, right? That means they're paying for it with money, not a freedom dividend. So just keep that in mind, but I guess you'll have $80,000 dish digging jobs to use to pay it, so. Don't believe the hype. We got a language problem. So if everybody doesn't jump on board with it, it doesn't mean that they don't want us to have universal health care. They don't want us to have access to basic coverage. I just showed you a lot of other countries do have uh, some type of additional insurance, whether that be some type of supplemental or complemental or whatever. Like there's other insurance that's added to the system. I think Angie Yang has thought about this. He, he made the wrong statement when he said disruptive. I think disruptive wasn't the thing to say. All of the plans are calling for it to be phased out over time. None of these are abrupt. Day one, sign a bill, and all of a sudden, there's no more private insurance. Not how any of this happens. I don't know if that was the best word to use. Okay, definitely was the best word to use. Yang will argue that private insurance is going to lead us to more innovation. I tend to agree. Um, if we're looking at outcomes instead of just getting things done, checking them off a box, which I think is what we would go to, under this Medicare for All system. If we have private insurance still competing and say, well, look, um, we can get you some better outcomes or we can give you some better drugs, they're still gonna innovate because there's something to gain. I just don't see the reason for the government to want to innovate on something that it's already taken care of. I mean, why would I compete with myself? They're leading you to believe that everybody is supporting Medicare for All, but half the people don't even know what Medicare for All is. So, so I'll give you all that, man. He needs to take Medicare for All off his website. When it's time to explain himself, He's the only person, I think, that uh, can, can get up in front of all Americans and say, this is why I want to do what, what I want to do. And people are going to walk away and say, you know what? I trust that guy. That makes sense. I agree. Bernie and uh, Warren are the only ones who want to completely get rid of private insurance. It, 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 is, it is exactly what it says it is. It's just not within the brand name. If you want to attack Andrew Yang for not supporting Medicare for All, that should be your reason because he doesn't want undocumented immigrants who aren't on a path to citizenship to also be able to take advantage of the healthcare system. That's the difference. That's the real difference. So if you have a real legitimate complaint, call it out. If not, understand that we all talking about the same thing, except for one guy or one guy and one gal want to completely get rid of <laughs> private insurance 
and nobody else in the world is doing that. We're talking about single pair. And again, people don't know what these things mean. People don't know the difference between single pair, public option, Medicare for all, Medicare for Yang, Medicare for he, Medicare for she, Medicare for America. This is just language. With all of that said, I'm still supporting Andrew Yang. I'm unwavered. I'm not, I'm not confused. Uh, at the end of the day, this is the guy who I trust to have this conversation on my behalf. Does Andrew Yang support Medicare for all? Sure, he does. But maybe he should have called it something different. Thank you guys for, for coming out to the stream. I appreciate you. Make sure you give this video a like. I'll see you guys soon.